So hi everyone, I'm Malik. I'm one of the critical care residents at Western Health here in Victoria. Um, and I'll be starting anesthetic training next year in 2023. And so um, we thought we'd put together this presentation just to talk to you about um, what my pathway has been like, what things I found useful um, over the years and things that I would recommend or wish I knew um, when I was going through from medical student years onwards. Uh, I'd really give you a bit of an introduction, Malik. So, um, so I'm here, so I'm from ABC's Anesthesia, and um, that's where I put most of my information and stuff. But the reason I asked Malik to come on board is um, he was our number one pick for the crit care physician. And I thought, you know, who better to talk to you about the early tra tra transition to the training program than Malik? Uh, when I did it, it was back in what, 2009 when I got on. So, you know, a lot of time has passed. You know, funnily enough, a lot of the stuff hasn't changed too much. But I thought, you know, it, be, Malik, being so recent, you'll have so much more information about, uh, you know, the important <laughs> subtleties of getting on the program and how to approach bosses and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, go keep going. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, Lahiru. Um, and like, if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, just, you know, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask away or put it in the chat and we'll make this quite interactive if we, um, if we can. All right. So everyone can see my screen. Yep, that looks good. Perfect. So this is just a summary of what we'll go through today. So essentially, we'll talk about the anesthesia training program. We'll talk about any application prerequisites that you need before you apply. Um, how to maximize your pre-training years, building up the CV, preparing for interviews, and how to get references. So this is some few resources that I might throw back to Lahiru to talk about. Yeah. Hey, so the, pretty much a lot of the stuff I, whenever I do an interview or whatever, it goes up on the ABCs of Anesthesia podcast, as well as my ABCs of Anesthesia YouTube channel. And there's a particular, like there's a whole set of stuff on the application process. So, you know, really easy listening on your drive to and from work, I guess. Um, and it's just me and Kaz going through all, everything that we think about and know about and how to apply for the program. So that's there. Um, and I've got, yeah, the, the one of those links is the training program playlist. But essentially, if you go on the YouTube channel, look at playlists, you, you'll see something like the training program or anesthesia training playlist. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that's really helpful. And we'll add some other stuff to um, what we're going to talk about today. Thanks, Mark. Perfect. All right, so this is basically a summary of my pathway um, to this year. I was first exposed to anesthetics back in 2017 as a second year medical student. Um, in third year of medical school, I um, did a four week elective in Warrnambool in anesthesia, which then solidified my interest for um, anesthesia. In fourth year, I did a selective within anesthetics as well at the Austin um, and did my MD research project through the department there as well. In 2020, I jumped ship and went to Western Health because they were offering a 12-week anesthetic rotation for interns. Um, 2021, did a surgical resident stream year at Western Health as well and managed to get a six-week anesthetic rotation as part of that. And then this year, I'm the crit care resident at Western where, where you get to do anesthetics, ICU and emergency rotations. And hopefully next year in February, I'll be starting um, training. Hey, Alan, just that thing. You know, when you said you managed to get uh, it was, it's very hard to come by these anesthetic rotations. How did you manage to get this extra six-week rotation? Yeah, on? so they are quite um, in demand, I would say, and there's not that many of them going around. The way I did it was um, just spoke to the medical workforce unit. I, I popped down one day um, and then sat down with our surgical stream coordinator and just explained to her why I really wanted to do an anesthetic rotation and how it'll help my career. And then yeah, she was kind enough um, to give me that rotation at the start of the year. Yeah, I mean, so that's what I ask, I think. I, I did exactly the same thing I've got to say. Um, I went straight up to the person who kind of runs a junior training program. I said, I want to do anesthetics. Please give me anesthetics at the start of the year. I'll do anything. Luckily, I didn't have to do anything. Um, and I, they just gave me an anesthetic rotation, which was perfect as a second year to get my crit care job for the next year. So you really just have to know where you're going and ask for stuff. Yeah. All right, so just a little bit about anesthetics, um, just very quickly. So essentially, anesthetists are involved in care of patients in all three stages of perioperative medicine. Now, most of your time will be spent in with intraoperative care of patients. And then that's where our focus is on the triad of anesthesia, that being um, giving adequate analgesia, amnesia or loss of consciousness, and then providing muscle relaxation as well. And that's either for optimizing surgical conditions or for airway management. Um, and so anesthetists are generally airway experts. Um, they're experts in managing patients' breathing and circulation. So if you think about it, we're just very highly trained homeostasis machines. But 
more and more now we're involved in preoperative care of our patients. That's like preoperative optimization, which is very much um, driven by a lot of research and evidence and postoperative medicine as well. And the biggest example of that is pain medicine. So as an anesthetic consultant, you get to work in a very wide range of settings. So you can work anywhere from a large metropolitan trauma center to smaller hospitals and even day surgery clinics. And your work generally is session-based. So you'll be allocated AM lists, PM lists, or be on an on-call roster um, overnight. There's opportunities to work both in the public and private sectors. And then within anesthetics, there's quite a few subspecialties as well. Um, if any of these interest you, so that's things like obstetric anesthesia, neuroanesthesia, or pediatrics. Um, in addition to that, there's pain medicine specialty, which is an extra two years of training after you've finished your um, fellowship of ANSCA. At the same time, there's opportunities to dual train with intensive care medicine, so you can become both an anesthetist and an intensivist. And so we'll talk a little bit about why anesthesia, why is this um, career one that I've you know, found really interesting and why um, I think it's a great career. Essentially, it's very fast paced. Um, anesthetics is real time medicine. It's applied physiology and pharmacology, um, where, for example, you've got a patient with a low blood pressure, you treat that immediately with some vasopressors, and you can see the response to your intervention happen quite quickly within minutes, um, which you don't really get to see much in other fields of other um, specialties of medicine. At the same time, it's uh, you're often involved in care of patients that are um, deteriorating or it's time critical management. Um, and so you really need to be on your feet, fast paced work. And an example of that that comes to mind that I guess was one of the first things that really drew me towards anesthesia was how um, I was shadowing a anesthetic registrar and there was a patient where code blue was called and they were um, hypoxic, uptunded. And as soon as the registrar arrived, she took a quick look at the patient, knew what she needed to do, went to the head of the bed, um, gave some rescue breaths with a bag mask valve and immediately the saturations came up. So that, you know, hands-on, fast-paced medicine is something that is really exciting. At the same time, it's quite diverse cases. So each case that you treat is uh, that you um, anesthetize is going to be different. Different operations have different challenges that you need to manage during the operation. Um, you're working with a very large team, so like your anesthetic nurses, surgeons, scrub nurses, and there are different teams on different days. So it is, some, it is constantly diverse, um, and which therefore makes it quite exciting. Um, the other aspect that I found quite rewarding about anesthetics is that you're caring for patients that are quite vulnerable. So if you think about it, patients that are presenting for operations are separated from their families, they're quite unwell, they're about to have an operation, and it's your role as the anesthetist to then make them feel comfortable and confident in your ability to guide them safely through their operative journey. Um, it's the anesthetist that wheels the patient into the operating theater, and the anesthetist that then wheels them back out. And so you've got a lot of opportunity to really impact on the patient's experience. So, and I find that part of anesthetics um, really rewarding and something that has really drawn me to it um, over the years. In terms of anesthesia um, in general, so there is a culture, a strong culture of support, and you'll feel that as soon as you're involved with any anesthetic department, but it really comes from the top down. So the um, anesthetic college, ANSCA, um, puts a lot of emphasis on releasing position statements about physician fatigue and how to manage that. They really emphasize well-being and work-life balance. Um, and at the same time, uh, a big example of that is when they introduced well-being into the continuing professional development requirements. So to maintain your registration as an anesthetist, every three years you need to explain to the college as part of your um, continuing professional development how you're going to be maintaining your well-being, which is, I think, a big step forward. Um, in addition to that, there's quite flexible working conditions. So like I mentioned before, you're working, your work is session-based which means you've got opportunities for part-time work, you've got opportunities to do more work outside of um, the operating theater. So you can do some research, teaching, like you were mentioning before, Lahiru. Um, and so it is quite flexible when it comes to that. And lastly, anesthesia is a field that has a big emphasis on research and evidence-based medicine. Um, it's a constantly evolving field because surgeries are becoming more complex, patients are becoming older and more comorbid. And so there's a big emphasis on research literature to guide our practice. Um, and the point that I'd like to make there is how there's a big emphasis on getting junior doctors involved as well. Um, so when I was a medical student as part of my MD research project, um, I was supported to go to Sydney and present my poster there, which is something that um, not many of my colleagues were able to do. But I think being involved in the anesthetics department where they have that culture of support really allowed me to do that. 
Hey, so this is one of those things, I think, practically speaking, you know, this is all good and well. If you haven't started anesthetic training, you'll be applying for training. And they will ask you this question, you know, why do you want to do anesthesia? So yeah, it, a lot of people will say reasons like this, but I really want you guys to think about that personal story when you're thinking about your applications and just go, you know, was there a moment, just like Malik was talking about, a sick patient, was there a moment that you thought, yep, this is what I want to do because I want to be that person doing these things. So as much as knowing what anesthesia looks like, which is pretty much this snapshot of this slide here, have a really personal story about what, you know, what changed you into considering anesthesia because I think that's the stuff that people remember, especially on interview panels. You know, everyone will say, oh, I love the um, fast-paced changes of physiology and pharmacology and apply applying these things. That's just a cliche these days. And so, you know, it's really important to have your own story for a lot of these uh, interview style questions. No, that's absolutely right. Because with so many people applying, you do want to be memorable and unique. Um, so find your own personal reason um, when you're applying. Um, perfect. So um, on that point, so what are the qualities of an anesthetist? What are things that the college is looking for in its applicants? So what I've got there is a screenshot of the selection criteria that's been released by ANSCA for its applicants to the training program. Um, and I can Google this, just search in, you know, ANSCA roles and practice selection criteria, but we'll go through it very quickly now. So essentially ANSCA is divided up into seven roles of practice for anesthetists. Um, on the left there, you can see the different roles. So medical expert is first because you need a large amount of knowledge and skills to, um, or specific technical skills to be able to perform the role of an anesthetist. So what they're looking for there is someone who has got a lifelong learning, um, I guess, ethos or approach. And looking for someone who's going to maintain their skills um, and continue to work and keep up with the most recent um, you know, advice or guidelines on how to manage patients. Communicator and collaborator are quite important as well, but, and that emphasizes the teamwork aspect of anesthesia. Leader and manager refers to the fact that often in crisis, situation crisis, it's the anesthetist that needs to step up and step up into the role of leader. And so having those leadership qualities are quite important. Health advocacy as well um, is like I mentioned before, our patients are unconscious and they can't advocate for themselves. So it's our role as the anesthetist to advocate for our patients. Um, scholar refers to the big emphasis on research and education. And lastly, professional, I think, applies to all of medicine. And so this framework I found really useful when you're trying to structure answers to um, any interview questions or you're trying to um, give or think about what brand you want to give to your application, what are the things that are your strengths that may be applicable to this, and then you really want to put context to it. So this is a really useful slide that I found in preparing for my application. Now let's talk quickly about the anesthetics training program. Essentially, it's a five-year hospital-based training program. The first two years are your basic training years, and the first six months are called introductory training, where you have a higher level of supervision. The second two years after that, so years three and four, are your advanced training years. And lastly, you have a one year of fellowship where you can take up rotations in anesthetics in areas of interest, as so things like um, obstetric anesthesia or neuroanesthesia. Now, for the training program, there is some flexibility, so opportunities for part time training or any interrupted training but it's a case-by-case -case basis um, for that. And so big exams when it comes to an ascending training program is there's two big ones, the primary exam and the final exam. So the primary is done during your basic training years, so years one and two, and is more about theory and applied physiology and pharmacology. And it's a multiple choice, short answer and vivas, whereas your final exam is done in years three and four, more often year four. And it's more of a formal assessment of your competence and knowledge and how ready you are to become a consultant. It's similar format to the primary where it's MCQs, short answer and medical vivas. Um, and on the next slide here, it looks quite busy, but essentially this is just a summary of the curriculum um, for the anesthetics training program. But the big point that I want to make here is the fact that you don't have any entrance exams. There's no volumes of practice requirements for you to apply to the anesthetics training program. And so you don't actually need to worry about any of this until you're actually on the program. Um, there's no assessments or any exams to get on. It's one of those things as well. Um, you go to the previous slide. Uh, when you're applying, they want you to know what a big deal these exams are. Like when you're applying for the program, you know, common question we used to get asked is, you know, what, is the, what, what are your strategies for getting through the primary exam? Like if you don't know, you need, you know, a thousand hours of time, maybe 12, you know, nine to 12 months of study, potentially getting a study group organized. And, and setting time away to get this exam, I think 
you know, you're doing yourself a disservice because it's such a big deal. It's got a decently high failure rate, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and it's just really important that you know what this training program looks like, especially the exams. Um, hey, Mel, I, I often get asked the question, should you do surgical? Like you don't need to do anesthetics before you're getting on the anesthetic training program, but should you be doing surgical years, general years or medical years? And what are your thoughts with that? Yeah, so um, in your like, PGY two or three years, um, I think the emphasis is again, like my, the best advice is to try and get as much anesthetic exposure as you can. But remember that that's just going to be one term out of your four. So what, in terms of which stream to choose, different people have different opinions, but I think just take up the stream that is more of interest to you. So for example, I'm someone who I think is more surgically minded. So I did a surgical stream. Um, and so even though I enjoyed my anesthetics term, my other three were things that I still enjoyed where I did vascular surgery and orthopedics. And so if you're more of a medically minded person where you enjoy cardiology or respiratory terms, then definitely medical stream is the one for you. Yeah, you want to play to your strengths. You want, yeah, like let's, let's say you even whatever you enjoy and if you already know people in the team, you'll probably get a better reference that way. So just treat yourself to good rotations that you like because that's the way you'll get good at you know, good references. So yeah, great advice. All right, so this is more specific to the um, Victorian anesthetic training scheme, but essentially there are four rotational schemes within Victoria, um, Northwestern, Eastern, Monash, and then a regional training network. And the point to make here is that it's a central application to VAT. Um, and then you get to select on there which rotational schemes you want to be considered for, and they each conduct their own shortlisting and their own interviews. And so in terms of applying for the anesthetics training program, these are the minimum requirements that you need. So you'll need two years of general hospital experience, so internship and PGY2, and that can include up to 12 months in anesthetics or ICU. You need a CV as part of your application, a cover letter, three references, and an interview, which is what I think is the most important part um, of the application. And so talking about your training years, or junior doctor years before you start training, we all start off as PGY1 interns. Um, PGY2, like we just mentioned, um, Lahiru, you can, there's multiple stream options. And the advice is take up the one that you would enjoy more. Because um, like Lahiru just said, um, that's where you're more likely to get a good reference. Um, after PGY2, the aim should be to try and get a critical care HMO year in PGY3+. plus. Now, the reason why is because there's a large number of critical care residents that are successful in getting onto the training program the year after they've done their critical care year. Um, here in Victoria, different hospitals have different success rates of getting their critical care residents onto the program. So ask around, ask your colleagues from the years before what the success rates have been in trying to determine which hospital you'd like to go to. Keeping in mind, these positions are quite competitive. Um, so it, will, it might take a couple of goes before you're able to uh, do one of these years. Um, other than that, there's um, unaccredited anesthetic registrar positions here in Victoria. They are quite limited. I think there's only a handful of them. Um, but that is another option and, um, of a year to do before you apply to the anesthetics training program. That being said, it is not a requirement. You do not need to have done a critical care HMO year or an unaccredited anesthetic year um, to apply to the program. And definitely people have been successful getting on without having these um, years done. And so the importance of anesthetic rotations, I think, are it's quite straightforward, but you'd know whether anesthetics is really for you, helps you get referees, good for networking and then getting involved with the department with audits and research opportunities. And so we'll talk about the CV now. Um, essentially, I divided up into five different sections. Um, that's research, publications and presentations, leadership, mentoring and volunteering, teaching and education, achievements and awards, and lastly, professional development. Now, if there is a specific area, for example, teaching that you've done a lot of work in, you may want to make this as a separate section for your CV. Um, but this is generally the um, breakdown that I've used um, over the past couple of years. Now, you don't need to be amazing in all five sections. I think nobody is. But just have something to list under each um, when you're building up your CV. And so we'll go through these now. In terms of research um, or you know, audits and presentations, the biggest advice here is to get in touch with the anesthetics department early to express your interest. Um, research takes quite a bit of time, and it is a big time commitment. Um, as an example, um, so I, like I mentioned before, I got involved with research in 2019 and the amount of time that it took for us to actually get something out of it, a publication, um, was around two years. It wasn't until 2021 that we were able to you know, get something to show for it. 
And so that's because you've got to go through your ethics applications, your data collection, data analysis, um, writing up the paper, submitting it, getting rejected, submitting it again. So it is, it is a long process. Um, my second advice is the best projects are the ones that can be done in a reasonable time frame. So you don't want projects that are going to drag on for a large number or a large amount of time. Um, and essentially discuss with your supervisors quite early what you want out of the project. So if you're aiming for a publication, have a chat to them about that initially. If you're working towards a poster presentation, again, make sure that you've discussed this with your supervisor so you're both working towards the same thing. Um, and like, like I mentioned before, um, the best projects are the ones that can be presented at conferences or ones that lead to publication. All right. So the next section is about leadership, mentoring, and volunteering. Yeah, I might just so, address the research thing. Uh, there's a really I, good question. Uh, is research, say, publishing a paper important in getting accepted to the training program? For example, you, if you don't have a PhD, is it useful or not? And I, I've got to say, it's um, the, I would almost say these days you really don't need a PhD. And even the prefer, uh, even the specialties that you used to need a PhD, now it's not an, any additional marks. Like I think ophthalmology used to be so competitive, you pretty much need a PhD to get on. And even then, now it's it, it, it has changed. So essentially, you want to have some level of research and hopefully some publications, but the level of having spent that much time doing a PhD is not necessarily advantages because um, it's not, yeah, it's just not for a number of reasons, it's not necessarily what people look for. Um, so that, that's, probably, that's probably the best important thing to say. But then just adding to what Malik said was, you know, first of all, there's not many research projects going and there's only so many people out there. So just remember that you don't have to just tag on to a research project. It's very easy to get your own project started um, by having your own ideas. If you have a question you need answered, just go to someone in the department. Usually, There's usually a research or you know, a couple of research-minded people. You know, just go to them and pitch them a few ideas. Like literally what I did back in my training years was, you know, I had, like I'd just come off a, a 70 hour a week surgical job and I went into the anesthetic rotation. I thought, man, this is so easy because I'm only doing 38 hours a week. And so I went to um, the supervisor's training and said, look, I've got some ideas for research. I'd like to get involved. And he said, no, no, don't worry about it. Just keep your nose clean. Just work hard. That's all we expect. But it felt like I had, like I genuinely was interested. I had some questions. And so I just went to the director and said, who's a you know, big research person. I said, I've got some ideas. Uh, do you mind um, listening to them? And you know, this person is so busy. He's typing away on his laptop. Uh, on his computer, and he says, yeah, you got five minutes. Uh, he just turns over to me, and I just pitch him these five ideas, four of which were, he just ignored completely, but the last idea he thought was something with legs. And literally, it was just like a choose your own adventure. I'd say, what do I need to do? And he said, yep, do a literature, literature review uh, and see what you find. And I would just come back to him every few days or every week with the next step and ask him where to go. Um, you can do this with anything. If you want to audit something that you find interesting, just approach someone to get advice how you do that. And it's not that hard to get these little things started. And from little things, big things grow. And audit becomes a small pilot study, becomes something you can present, becomes a poster, becomes a publication. You just got to get started. Just start with something and just don't leave it too late. You know, When you're an intern, when you're a resident, just get something on the ground. No, that's, that's absolutely true. And, pro and approaching someone directly might actually be the best way to do it because I was talking to a few um, of my of interns at work. And essentially, when you reach out to the department and you say, hey, I'm really interested in anesthetics, you know, I want to be involved in a research project or an audit, you'll just be told, hey, there's a long queue, join the back of the queue, and we'll be in touch soon, hopefully. Um, so a better way, like you mentioned before, is if you've got an idea of your own that you really want to pursue, then just approach the right person. So for example, if you're um, looking at something within perioperative medicine, then reach out to the perioperative lead within the department. Or if it's about medication errors, then reach out to the um, safety and quality and any citizen in the department. So approaching them directly might actually be a quicker way of getting involved. You had a really good strategy for that was what you actually did was, and we'll go cover this a little bit later, but you went to the ANSCAD bulletin, I think, to find out what was topical. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was when a new study had come out called Prevent, and it's, um, it was talking about the utility of iron infusions um, before operations and how, whether their outcome is beneficial or not. And essentially, it was ingrained in all our pre-admission um, pre clinic, um, I guess, practice that everyone who's iron deficient needs to be given an iron, iron infusion. And so when I read that, I went to the perioperative um, medicine consultant and just said, hey, should we be looking at our iron infusion practice here at Western Health? And they really liked the idea. And then and that's how the project was born. So um, 
it was a better way, I think, than just waiting at the back of a queue and then not hearing anything for a couple of months. Yeah, everything is about initiative. Like whether you're, you know, you can extend this to anything else. You could just pay the money to do a course or you could do a course and then ask to be an instructor. Or maybe you could run your own little course for medical students to help them learn cannulation or airway management or whatever it is. Initiative is so well rewarded. I, you know, I look at CVs, you know, I look at hundreds of CVs uh, every year to, for the application process. And someone that started something, is, it's so impressive to me because they, they, they're starting something out of nothing. They, they're creating something that didn't exist before. It takes so much to do that. So yeah, you're not, you're not just kind of you know, being, being led on like, like everyone else. Um, some more questions here. When is the most valuable time uh, to start researching for research opportunities? Is it worth doing, doing during clinical medical student years or does this not really count towards anything? So I think it does because that's the lead time. You start it whenever you want to start it. Um, and medical student audits, you know, you get the contacts, people know you're interested. It becomes something else. And that lead time may be a few years. So do that audit, do that literature review and see what happens. Um, and trust me, you know, it, it's making lots of contacts early on that really helps. And um, I, think get, I think get involved as early as possible because that just gives you more time to be able to work towards something. So getting involved early and even during medical school years um, is definitely worth it. I like this question. Instead of a PhD, definitely any kind of, um, you know, a, a course is a day or two days. Um, a diploma is longer, uh, you know, diploma, a certificate and diploma than master's. Absolutely. And if it's something in perioperative medicine, what you learn from that will definitely count to your knowledge later. So I highly recommend doing any of those new perioperative masters, even starting with a perioperative short course with Monash. Really, really good idea. And again, it's, it's not just about the fact that you've done this course, but the fact that you're now immersed in the environment of anesthesia and you're meeting people who are interested in anesthesia and consultants, and that will give you, you know, open doors. You can't suddenly turn up on the doors of anesthesia, even if you're a professor of um, something in obstetrics, and you won't get a shoe in because you know, you, you're not in the in in the in the world of anesthesia. Um, and are HMO three critical care years with ICU and ED no anesthetics still useful for getting onto the VATS program? Meaning that we'd be applying without anesthetics rotations or referees. It's it's definitely more ideal to have anesthetics in the rotation. That's your absolute. You know, that's the kind of the gold standard for getting on. But if you've got ICU and ED, and people often there's a lot of contact between ICU and anesthetics. A lot often our audits might, you know, translate. You might want to present something from ICU in the anesthetic meetings. It's definitely doable to get onto anesthetics training after doing ICU and you know just showing that effort. One of the other tips I have is if you're doing ICU, meet the anesthetic consultants, have a chat with them. Um, and there's often a teaching morning where you can say, "I'd like to upskill on my airway management because I work in ICU." So for us in the Western, it's like Monday and Tuesday morning your primary and your secondary part, people have their teaching. So, you know, uh, there's a lot more space in theaters for that. Um, how important is it that research is in anesthesia versus, say, surgery? I'd say it counts for very little difference. Would you say, Malik? Yeah, I think, I think definitely it is quite important. Um, but like you said, you don't have to have, you know, 15 publications or a PhD, but I think showing some interest in research is very much um a good boost for your application because anesthetics itself has a big emphasis on research. So as part of your training, you actually have to do a, um, a scholar role as part of your assessment where you need to conduct a, either an audit or a research project. So it is very much embedded within the practice of anesthetics. So I'm very, again, it's, it's, um, I'm impressed not by, so actually get, this is very important to know. I don't care if you've done no anesthetics, if you're impressive, because we, uh, you will learn the most anesthetics you could have done before coming onto the training program is maybe six months if you're lucky nine, but most people have done three months. But so that small amount of anesthetics, you will quickly catch up to everyone else. Uh, and if you hadn't done anesthetics, you will definitely catch up to it. So I actually care very little how much anesthetic experience you have. If you're, if you're a fantastic person, you do well in everything else in the interviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I just don't care. It's very impressive if you've done publications in anything else. So Please don't ever think you need to have done anesthetics. It, the only advantage of having done anesthetics is you get the references and are in the know because there's people around you. That's the only advantage. But I, I you know, I will definitely give people opportunities, and I, I absolutely want to interview people who've done very good things uh, with, um, you know, other other areas. Um, yeah, so, um, oh, sorry, go. 
So, so on that point, um, I think quite a few of the critical care residents that I know hadn't done any anesthetics at all before applying for their critical care role. Um, and they were all very successful because they had um, other impressive things in there. So I think that's definitely um, hitting the nail on the head there. Yeah. Uh, audits versus research. Rich told me audits are high yields. Is this true? Um, so again, to me, it's F effort. So if you've done many audits that go on to do something that's important and meaningful, I would be very impressed by that. But generally speaking, to publish a paper takes a lot of time and effort and initiative and creativity. If you're the last author on a, on a few papers, it's not bad. You know, you've still done a lot of work versus you, you led a research, so you led an audit project that made a change in a hospital and you've told, you know, you've put that in your CV. And so uh, 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 it, it could be better, but generally speaking, research that leads to publication is looked on more favorably. Um, when I was in OR as an RN, I jumped in doing all things really challenged at that time. That's great. Excellent. Cool. Keep going. Brilliant. Alrighty. So the next section of the CV is about, you know, leadership, mentoring, or volunteering experience. Um, now, leadership can actually be many different things. And a lot of the things that you have probably already done um, would involve elements of leadership that you haven't really considered to be a leadership role. And I've got a few examples here of things um, that you could list under here. So that's like involvement in the RMO Society. And something that I wish I had done, but I um, just didn't have enough time to is join a workplace committee. So every hospital has a deteriorating patient committee um, or something along those lines where there are opportunities for junior doctors to get involved and contribute. And I think that is something that looks very favorable on your CV. Um, you can have leadership positions outside of medicine that are very relevant. So it's example sports or any previous lines of work. In terms of mentoring, um, that could be mentoring for medical students, mentoring for intern programs. Um, or if you started your own mentoring program, like Phil Hero was saying, that is something that is taking it the next step forward. And lastly, um, volunteering work also looks quite good on a CV, and that's things like St. John's Ambulance, overseas volunteer work, or anything else um, that you might have done. Right. So the next section is about teaching and education. So again, just a few examples of different things you might want to pursue in this section. So that's things like if you're given presentations to any um, medical students, interns as part of your um, weekly teaching. If you've been involved in any simulation programs through the medical school, um, as a junior doctor, if teaching is something that is, is that you are very interested in, you can get in touch with the medical school department at your workplace and see if there's any opportunities for you to be involved. And lastly, um, becoming a course instructor is something that, again, shows a lot of commitment and a lot of um, I guess, dedication to teaching. And an example of that is becoming an ALS2 instructor. So once you sit the ALS2 course, if you've done well enough, you might be nominated as someone with instructor potential. So then going on to get onto instructor um, courses and then being involved in the ALS2 program is something that um, I think is quite a good thing to do. Uh, we'll go on to the next section. So this is about achievements and awards. Um, and essentially, it, awards could be things like academic awards that you might have received um, in uni or during your studies, any scholarships that you were nominated for and been successful in getting. But as, extracurricular achievements can be quite relevant as well. So if you, it's, it shows that you've set a goal for yourself, you've made a plan to reach that goal, and then you've actually gone on and achieved it. And that could be things like running you know, a full marathon or raising a, a sum of money for a charity or things like that. Now, the point to make here is that often awards or prizes are things that are not very well advertised. And so you do need to go hunting for them. Um, you can look through the Yogi University website or speak to heads of departments or deans or any other colleagues of yours about any awards that might be available for you to apply to. Um, an example of that is um, during medical school, there was an award for um, the best case report written in anesthetics, but it wasn't very well advertised. So I think in the end, only around seven people um, up submitted case reports for it. So winning that award was not as difficult as it could have been. Um, so definitely something you need to go and hunt for. And lastly, professional development. So this is mostly about courses that you can do to um, develop your skills, um, as well as attendance at different conferences. So I've listed down there courses that I think are relevant. Um, now, they may be more suited for you to do at different stages of your training. So, um, for example, the STAR course at RMH, which is specific to anesthetic residents, is more useful in your second or third years um, as opposed to internship. But essentially, the, um, the different courses are those that are specific to anesthesia. So like the STAR course, um, the Better Pain Management course, 
There's specific airway courses like NATCAT, ACE, or Airway Matters. Um, but the big ones here, I think, are ALS2 and BASIC, which are the most useful courses that I think. So um, just take a photo of this slide if you want and keep this list with you as things that you can try and do over the years. Um, and just a reminder there, ASA memberships of Australian Society of Anesthetists is actually free if you're a doctor in training. So um, sign up, it can be quite useful. Perfect. So just a few final points about the CV. So essentially try and make it look professional. I think this is quite important. Um, Lahira, I know you'd agree that you, when you're looking through hundreds of CVs for an application, you do want ones that look professional, do stand out, you know, draw your attention to them. So if this is something that you can do pretty well yourself, fantastic. But if you think like you need some help, show it to your consultant, show it to your colleagues who might be really good at doing things like that, um, just to make it look as best as you can. Um, on top of that, the Australian Medical Association um, runs a free one-on-one -on -one CV review service. Um, so get in touch with them. You'll send them your CV in advance. They review it for you. And then they have a video call with you and talk you how, about how to improve your CVs. Um, I guess like typography or its style. So uh, it was a quite useful um, service that I used in my applications. Yeah, brilliant. Um, I can't stress enough how important you need to make it look and it's just one of those things where, you know, first impressions is everything. Um, if you're going to put a photo, make sure it's a good photo. I, I do recommend putting a photo. I don't know if that's um, not allowed in some applications or not, but put a photo there. You're looking professional. You, you know, you you have a, a face to the name. Um, and uh, you know, there's there's all these, uh, if, you, if you haven't heard of these services, I, I, you know, I constantly use this for freelancers, for ABC's anesthesia, but Upwork or Fiverr, uh, pretty much you can get people internationally uh, at very low cost to just edit and format your CV and make it look amazing. So really, really, really recommend that you, you absolutely need to do this because it's just, it really is the difference between getting interviews or not getting interviews. Excellent. So the next bit is about the cover letter. Now, there's not too much to say about this, except for the fact that you've got to make sure there's no spelling mistakes, make sure it's perfect grammar and it's addressed to the right person. You don't want these small things to be the difference in you getting an interview or not. Um, and essentially on there, I've just written down how I divide up my cover letter. So the first paragraph is just about introducing yourself and the purpose of your letter. The second paragraph is about why anesthetics. Why is it that you want to do this field or why you, you want to do anesthetic as your career? The third paragraph is more about why you, what are your strengths? You try and address the selection criteria um, that we mentioned before and talk about what value you will bring um, to the anesthetic training program. So if you've got any big achievements here, um, this is where he lists it. And lastly, is just uh, about wrapping up your cover letter. This is very much a form, you know, in many ways, it's a formality. It, it, it's very rare for me to see a cover letter that I just go, oh, that is, that's changed my mind about someone. But if you write a cover letter that's not good, it, it definitely affects my impression. And, and just know that all of this is a game, you know, does a cover letter matter to you being a good anesthetist? Does a CV, does references, the evidence would say absolutely not. The, apparently the only thing that really correlates with good performance in a job is your medical school grade, but we barely go on that. So just understand it's a game. You have to make this stuff look good. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just remember I kept a logbook. So, you know, everyone's cover letter says the usual stuff about how they're a great communicator and a fantastic all round person. Uh, but to actually put concrete stuff like Mal said, you know, I achieved this, I tried this. I remember putting, in, I, I, had, I kept a logbook for all my anesthetic rotation. And just being able to put the number of things I had done, you know, like yeah, I somehow done an incredible amount of anesthetics in three months and, and more in six in, in the next nine months. And people would look at that and go, oh, that sounds impressive. That was a point of difference to people reading my cover letter versus everyone else's. So I, I know that this can make a difference and bold, underline, it, italics, whatever you need to draw people's attention. Because literally, I'll look at it and go, oh, that's a spelling error. Oh, that person was meant to apply for Western Health and has St. Vincent's Hospital on their title. These are critical errors um, when we're looking for people who are thorough and very you know, purposeful in what they do. All right. So let's talk about the interview now. now. I think this is the most important part of the application. So I think of your CV, your cover letter, and your references are all there just to get you that interview. Once you've got that, I think it's all about your performance on the day. Um, so for the interview, it's a panel interview usually. It can be anywhere between three um, consultants up to seven. And if you're not expecting seven consultants to be sitting there in front of you on the table, that can be quite confronting. Um, so definitely ask around and see what the interview was like the year before so you know what to expect. 
It will last anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes and can be um, anywhere between four or five questions. Now, there's five main types of questions that you may be asked in an interview. The first would be about you know, your motivation for applying to the program and your brand. So essentially, it's about why you want to do anesthetics uh, or why your, what, are, what are your strengths? Um, why should we pick you? And these are questions that I think you need to have an answer prepared for. Um, not necessarily rote learned, but having three main points that you'd like to say for each of those. The situational questions, which are about, tell us about a time when something happens. So for example, tell us about a time when you made a mistake. Um, and this is where it's pre preparing is quite useful because thinking about an example on the spot can be quite difficult. Um, so you, in, in preparation for your interview, you want to have different examples from your um, experiences over the past couple of years that you can draw upon for different scenarios. Um, there can maybe some general questions, so things like what are your thoughts on a specific topic? So, for example, what are your thoughts on the aging population in Australia, etc. Clinical questions or clinical governance questions um, can be asked as well, and that's things about you know, how you would respond to a hypotensive patient post-operatively, or about more of a you know ethical situations, or you know um, you've noticed a colleague of yours make a medication mistake, um, you know how would you approach that, etc. Lateral thinking questions um, are becoming less common now, um, but they may still be asked. Um, and they're more assess what your thought process is in a difficult situation. So an example of that would be, how would you determine how many cannulas are used by the anesthetics department every year? So I just wanted to go through how you would actually approach a problem like that. Um, but it could be something really weird as well. So I think a recent question that was asked was, would you rather fight a duck-sized horse or um, 100 horse, 100, sorry, it's 100 duck-sized uh, horses, or would you fight one horse-sized duck? Which I don't know what the purpose of that question was, um, but it was asked. So um, be ready for something unusual like that. And, and I just want to let people know that the people on the interview panel were, were anesthetists, and somehow we're judging you in an interview to get onto the program. We have no training in interviews, except the fact that we're an this and we've, no, we've been in many issues. So you don't know who's choosing these questions. You don't know what their thought process is. But again, it comes back to be impressive, be practiced, rehearse. You know, I'd, I'd say absolutely you need to start four weeks beforehand uh, practicing with this stuff. And yeah, this um, QR code is just a Spotify link to the interview prep uh, think the podcast uh, chapters. So um, yeah, just just go through that because we, we we talk about lots of these things, lots of it, lots of lots of scenarios as well, um, and absolutely practice in front of people that you were embarrassed to talk in front of your partner, your family, your siblings, your colleagues. Just get someone to listen to you because you absolutely like you said, like this could count for almost hundred percent. Once you've got the interview, yeah. do, and again, it's variable. There's no rules about this. It could count for hundred percent once you've got the once you've got the interview. So you know, if you're an introvert. And you've got the interview, and the extroverts out there will absolutely not normally be better. You need to practice to be charismatic and be likable, and just give really good answers. Yeah, so preparation is absolutely key for um, these kinds of interviews. You know, they're not ones where it's a conversation and they get to you know get a feel for your personality, have a chat with the consultants, and then you know off you go. It's very much, you know, we've got four questions to ask you. Here's the question. You've got three minutes to answer and we're moving on to the next question now. So definitely something that you need to prepare for. And in preparing, I think, try and make it as realistic as possible. So I'm um, applying for the ANSCA program this year. A lot of my practice was with friends over Zoom or over a coffee, so quite informal. But in the two weeks before the interview, I actually um, did a practice session with one of my friends and we put on our suits, we waited outside of the room, knocked on the door, walked in, and that just made it feel a lot more real. And I felt really anxious in that moment. And I performed definitely a lot worse than I usually do in my casual practices. And so you do want to try and make it as realistic as possible so that those feelings are not happening for the first time on the day. And by the time you've gone to the interview, you know, it's a piece of cake. You've done this a hundred times. It's you're used to this feeling. So Definitely practice as much as you can. And that's basically the main point that I'm trying to make on this next slide. Preparation is absolutely key. And there's a lot of preparation that you can do. So for my critical care HMO interview, I started preparing four weeks before. But for my ANSCA application this year, the interview was in August. And I started preparing back in April. Um, not as heavily, but definitely started quite early on because there's quite a few things that you need to cover. So the ANSCA bulletins is one of the um, big things. 
So the ANSCA releases four bulletins every year and it goes through all the different topical areas in anesthesia um, going on at the time. And quite a few of the questions in the interviews will be drawn out from articles from the bulletins. Um, so recently there was uh, an article in one of the bulletins about social media and bullying. And one of the questions we got asked was about the social media policy. And so leading on to that, the ANSCA professional documents are definitely things that you need to cover as well. Um, it helps you understand what the position statements of the college are, gives you information about the social media policy, about you know, how to manage um, fatigue, how to approach exams, um, and you know, other really useful things that you can then use verbatim into, in your answer um, for the interviews. Now, other than that, the ABCs of anesthesia oops, podcast I found really useful because it's something that you can listen to in the car. But what Lahiru and one of the other anesthetic registrars, um, CAS, go through is different frameworks and structures for different kinds of questions. Now, structure, having a structure or a framework to your answer is probably the most useful thing that you can work on in practicing. Um, and having different structures for different questions is quite useful. So that's something that the podcast really helped me with. Um, second to that, there's the ISC Medical Interview Skills Consulting book, which goes through you know, common questions asked in medical interviews, and they give you advice on how to approach those kind of questions. So that was really useful reading for me as well. And lastly, you know, practice, practice, practice. You know, start early, practice with your consultants that might make you nervous, practice with your colleagues who are also applying. Um, make yourself a PowerPoint with the different kind of questions that might be asked and use that to put down your brainstorming for different examples that you might want to use for different scenarios. Like, for example, uh, an example of when you demonstrated leadership, an example of when um, communication worked really well, a time when you made a mistake, all these different scenarios you want to have an example for that you can draw upon on the interview day. And in terms of record yourself, this is something that I didn't do too much of. But I did do it a couple of times. And what I noticed that I use the word um quite a bit when I'm giving my answers, and it can be quite distracting. And so it's something that I tried to work on um, in the lead up. So it can be useful. Um, so just something that you can try and do, I suppose. And that's it for interviews. So actually, just quickly with the, um, the ANSCA bulletin, literally first yeah. hit on Google ANSCA bulletin, and it's all free to download. So you can easily get that. The ANSCA professional documents. Uh, might also be accessible, but they're pretty dry uh, to have a look at. But um, the, the, the relevant ones for you will be the welfare special interest group welfare documents, which talk about breaking bad news and you know in, the impaired colleague and stuff. So I've got all of that on the ABC Anesthesia Foundations course in a folder. Um, uh, but yeah, otherwise you can try to find it on the ANSC website. Yeah, give, give me a shout if um, you can't find it. I'll be able to uh, point you to that link as well. Yeah, they're all PDFs that are free to download from the website. Um, perfect. So referees um, is the last bit. Now, getting an anesthetic reference can be quite stressful and difficult, mainly because the rotations are quite short. And at the same time, there's a lot of consultants within each department. So the chances of you working with the same consultant multiple times is quite low. And so my advice for this is in the first you know, two, three weeks of your anesthetics rotation, if you found there's a few consultants that you get along with well, then ask them and then ask the, the um, rostering individual to put you on lists with them for the remainder of your rotation. That way you get to work with them a bit more, they get to know you a bit better, and then hopefully be able to give you a better reference. Other than that, just be prepared for your anesthetic rotation. Um, look up medications that we use commonly um, in advance, have a bit of knowledge about um, different kinds of anesthetics, different um, medications that we use. Look up your list in advance. Um, the night before or the morning off your list, and that way you appear prepared to your consultant, which um, can help in giving them a good image of yourself. Um, be proactive in seeing your patients before you speak to them, speak to your consultant about them. Have questions or different topics that you want to discuss ready. Um, you might spend quite a bit of time in theater with your consultant, and after the excitement of induction is over, um, there's not much to really talk about. So if you have the topics ready, if you've got questions ready, um, that can make it quite engaging. And lastly, asking for feedback, I think is something that is very useful, both in terms of you advancing your own skills and your own learning, but it also looks really um, good to a consultant when they've got a junior asking them for feedback, wanting to learn. Um, and that is often something that they would list down in your reference um, for the applications. And so we've just listed down there a few examples of how you can ask for a reference. So um, I think what I asked one of my consultants was, you know, would you be happy to support my application for the anesthesia training program? 
because the applications are so competitive, you don't want to average or mediocre reference to be the difference in whether you get onto the program or not. Um, so you do give your consultants the opportunity to say, actually, I haven't worked with you enough. Um, you know, maybe I'm not able to give you a reference this time. So if you that's, phrase it like that, you give them an out, <laughs> essentially. Right? You, you definitely don't want them to feel... Every, no one wants to say no. Everyone's polite. And so by saying something, I'm going to be happy or... Do, do you know my practice well enough to give me a reference? They can say, oh, actually, I, don't, I haven't been with you enough. Great. You never wanted that reference anyway, yeah. <laughs> because that would be not a good enough reference. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and on the bottom there, we've just got another way of asking them um, if they're happy for you to be rostered on them, uh, on more lists with them. Um, and that way you can get someone who knows you a bit more and can give you a better reference as well. It's a big thing. Like when I get asked for a reference, um, it can be a bit of a surprise. And uh, let's say you weren't expecting it. And let's say the person didn't perform well enough for you to give a great reference. And that's happened to me a few times. I would have really liked that person at the start to say, I like working with you. Do you mind? I had a few more lists and, you know, if I'm performing well, improving the guidance, that way I can literally say, this is what I expect you to do. And if you do those things, you get a good reference. It's that simple. And if you don't, then you, we both know that you didn't perform well. So there's no surprises there. So I think it's a really open disclosure kind of way of getting someone to tell you what they expect. And then if you've done it, then what more can you do? Um, yeah, so I, so I found that this, someone used this technique and I thought, this was a really great way of phrasing it. Two common questions that um, you, know, you usually get asked about referees. And the first is, do they all have to be anesthetists? Now, I think for your critical care applications, they don't all need to be anesthetists. Um, definitely one of mine was an emergency physician, um, but it can also be a surgical consultant. For your ANSCA applications, um, generally what people try and do is have all three as anesthetists. Um, and that is, I guess, what I would recommend as well. I don't know whether it's frowned upon. I don't know what um, your thoughts are on that. Here, you might have a bit more of inside information, but um, I think the, I think having three anesthetists is probably the best option when applying for ANSCA. Yeah, like if you spent enough time in anesthesia during a care year, it would make sense to have, I'd say, at least two, and then another consultant. Um, now, what we really, really want to see, like most consultants, will tick the boxes and you know, four out of five, five out of five, the exceptional and the very good kind of categories. So most consultants will give us. So that's never a real point of difference. But what is a point of difference is when they write things down and the way they write it really expresses to us. So uh, I've definitely had people say, would you mind writing comments? That's what they look at. And that was that was absolutely correct for them to ask that. I would I would want you to ask your references to say, please, if you know, if you wouldn't mind, would you be able to write some things down? Because that's what they look at. Because that is exactly what I look for. And I know all of my colleagues look for that because then we get a feel for exactly how exceptional they think you are. Or if they've just said kind of lukewarm words, we, we get a sense of that as well. Um, yeah, at the, at the end of the day, the, the, all the references are generally pretty good. So it doesn't, for the quick applications, it, it hasn't often swayed me one way or the other because they're all of a decent level. I'd say the fact that your CV has lots and lots of good stuff for me personally seems like more of a, a bit of a hit. This, you know, if you get a great reference from someone really well respected in, in the department, then it's kind of a very it's a it's a very good thing and that should support your application. But you know, most of the time it's it's like, you know, make sure you get a decent reference. Otherwise, uh, who, who ha have you impressed anyone? Um, the second question I hear is then about, you know, I want to know what you think about this. Yeah. Should you ask uh, a junior consultant that knows you really well, or should you ask a head of department who you might have worked one list with? What's your thoughts on that? Um, ask the consultant who's going to give you the better reference. Because even just remember that junior consultants aren't any less regarded. For example, they might be a consultant in there who's much senior and the head of something but maybe they don't have the greatest reputation and maybe they're not as involved. And, you know, it's very, it's very easy for a junior consultant to have a very good reputation. But just remember, those consultants were hired in a very tight job pool, whereas the older consultants had a, probably an easier time getting, getting that job. So I would absolutely say, don't worry too much about the seniority. Gets, the junior guys that we get, they're exceptional people because it's so tough to get a job these days. Um, to, get, to get a job at a public hospital is, in, you know, incredibly difficult. I think when... Uh, you know, during during our time when we were going through, you know, maybe 
But before that, if like when I started training, you could walk into any job you wanted. And by the time the GFC hit, people weren't retiring. And then we were going through our process, you know, a handful of people every year got a public job and it was just, you know, just a really tough job market. So absolutely ask anyone who will believe in you. Um, hey, what are uh, one of the questions in the chat? What are the college's views of those applying for the program multiple times? Do you only have one to two attempts realistically? Is there a three strikes rule like some other programs? So that's a really good question. So the first thing to say is uh, there's no three strikes rule. That's um, you, you can apply as many times. I'm, I'm almost certain that you can apply as many times as you need. Um, if you do apply for the program multiple times and you're not getting on and you've applied widely, there's usually a reason for that. And you really need to try to figure out that reason. Um, because I know there's people who've applied many times and they, you know, like the, it's it's everything from their CV just isn't strong enough. Like the, you know, like the, the field that you're in is just an incredibly tough field of people who've done great things. And if it's not strong enough, it's, it's, it's you're never going to get an interview. Um, or you are just terrible interviews. You just can't present yourself in a competitive way. But you need to figure out what that reason is. And, and I've got to say, if you come to me, I'll tell you straight if I've seen what your thing is. But I, I don't think that's necessarily um, a common thing. So if you are in that position, maybe another state or another training scheme, I want you to be able to go up to the person and say, look, I really want to do anesthetics. And you know, I, 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 I don't mind really tough feedback. I really need to know what it is. And just try to find out what, what, what they're trying to tell you. Um, yeah, and, and, and realistically, once someone has tried a few times, it's, I think at the back of people's minds, unofficially, it feels like, uh, you know, why didn't they get on? Maybe, maybe that's something to address in your interview. I, I, I don't know. But I think there may be a perception of if you've tried many times and not gone on, then there is an issue somewhere that we haven't uncovered or something like that. But that's unofficially and very anecdotally what people might talk about. Um, is there a formal or informal recency requirement for research, extracurriculars or further study? Look, I'd say, generally speaking, you know, having things in the last five years probably is pretty reasonable at a junior training level. Um, if you've got really great stuff from you know, things you did, the, 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 the more amazing they are, like let's say you're an Olympic gymnast in high school, absolutely put that down. If you, you know, did something a little less you know, magnificent back then, it's probably not worth putting down. But I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any, you know, if you've done research and done some publications, even in your early medical student years, somehow, absolutely put it down. Um, yeah, okay. essentially, that's the end of this talk. Um, the summary, I think anesthetics is a great career choice. Um, I, th I know that what we've spoken about today might seem like it's a lot of things that you need to do before you can apply. Um, but really, it's you've got so much time to do it all. And if you just start early enough, and you've got a consistent effort, then it's just one thing at a time, you work towards it. And the next thing you know, what you've built up a really good CV, you've got to build up a really good application. So um, it may feel overwhelming now, but definitely it is manageable in smaller chunks, just one thing at a time, work towards it, and eventually you will get there. Um, and so good luck to everybody. And I hope this has been useful. Yeah, thanks for the things in the chat. Hey, thank you so much, Malik. That was like, just so useful. I'm, I'm sure because I, I, again, I, I never got this talk when I was going through training and it's often the hospital prescribed talks. They can't really give you the insight. To, I've definitely said some stuff here that's potentially controversial <laughs> and not exactly, you know, the right thing to say. Um, you but said this I, was recorded? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely recorded, but I, I really want you guys to have no questions about the, you know, what, what this is like. Um, so we'll, we'll stick around for a bit now and please write some questions in the chat or ask verbally. Um, the next question is, is there any preference favorability between taking your time to get onto the program versus trying as soon as possible? That's a really good question. I'd say you want to have started stuff in your medical student years, in your, in, in your intern years, so that by the time you're in your second year, you are applying for crit care years. Um, it, you know, it, 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 often medical people are pretty motivated and, and they, you know, just the fact that you're in the environment of, you know, departments doing research, most people do get involved. So I'd say you, you, should, you should time it to apply in your se second year for a crit care year and then crit year for a, tra for a training job. If that's delayed by one year, I just suspect, what, you know, if you haven't already started something, what can you achieve in one year? 
say, you know, projects wise, let's say you can do that. Absolutely. You know, you, you, if you've got, if you go from nothing to an incredible CV, absolutely take the time. But most people have something there that they've plugged away at. So uh, I, I would say get, get onto that treadmill. It's more important that you get the anesthetic rotation and people know you. And once they know you, you're in the department, you do projects, that's far more important than the most impressive CV. Yeah, any other questions, anyone? Again, feel free to ask anything at all that might even be um, uh, controversial. Like, we, you know, I'll, I'll tell you whatever uh, I can. <laughs> Thanks, it's very nice meeting you. Beautiful. And what is a HMO? Yeah, is this a Victorian specific term? Go for it, Malik. What's a I HMO? think it's a, a hospital medical officer. It's the same as resident. I think the terms are used interchangeably. So it's it's any year after your internship um, and before your registrar, essentially. Yeah, and, and really that reference is a non-training doctor, you know, so someone who isn't on the training program yet. How do you choose between the North and Western and Monarch schemes? Is it based on which hospitals you've you worked at before? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say... E- within each of those schemes, there's certain hospitals that have a more favorable care year. Literally ask the people the year before, what are the chances of getting on? What's their strike rate? Things like that. Um, and what was the year like? Because the years change every year as well. So there's a lot of groundwork to do and a lot of people to talk to. But, you know, you, you just need to get into the hospital and, you know, find out who the registrars are to talk about that. Um uh, let's see. So I, I'd say whichever hospital you're in is that it gives you the best chance of getting the job because they know you. Um, so that's probably the best way. Like if you want to move in your second year, that's fine. But by the time you get a quick care, you're applying for a quick care, apply everywhere. You'll probably get the quick care job in the hospital you trained at, but you know, go anywhere for that. Um, would you be able to speak a little about dual training specifically? Um, specifically ICU and how this looks regarding applying for an sex program, not focused on anesthesia purely. But yeah, that's definitely not um, a problem. If, if someone said they were interested in ICU and anesthetics, it's not as common to do that, but there's plenty of people who do all train. Um, most people end up in their consultant practice, end up specializing one or the other, just because it, it is a lot of knowledge in each of the fields. Um, so I, I often find that pe- people are more often... Yeah, it, it really depends on the makeup and it very much reflects the ability of the hospital to balance those rosters as well. But not a bad thing to be uh, looking at dual training, but it's not an advantageous thing either. It's just a neutral thing, I'd say. Um, I'm studying in New South Wales. Do you recommend interstate applications? Yeah, it, it, it probably is harder um, to get into just because you don't know the field, but there's plenty of times someone's had a, an exceptional CV and you know the references are fine. And they've got a reason that's specifically laid out that sounds very plausible in their cover letter. Um, if, if that's the case, they get an interview. But I'd say uh, from just logically, it's, it's easy to be in the hospital in the, in, the, in the state that you're in. Yeah, but I think if you're willing to go interstate for training, then applying, you've got nothing to lose and it just increases your chances, if anything. So. Hmm. Hey, this is a good one for you, Malik. Um, you're probably close to having kids than I am. When's a good time to have kids start a family as a trainee? Yeah, I'm actually thinking about that right now. Um, <laughs> probably the best time is in... Be- so if you're going to do it as a trainee, in between exams. So um, you've got your primary in the first two years. So I'll be sitting mine in March 2024. And then your fellowship exam will be around two and a half or three years after that. So I think after your primaries and before your fellowship is the best time to have a kid. That's a really good practical answer. But I, I just want to say how important, um, oh, you know, career is career. I just think friends, family is just the most important thing. I didn't have balance when I was going through training. It was anesthetics and nothing else. Um, <laughs> uh, and and I, I'd almost say, you know, if, if you have, I think the reality is anesthetic training and especially exams are very hard. Um, and so to balance that with, having kids and family is more difficult than the way I was, which was, you know, I, I didn't have any dependence and didn't have any issues to sort out with family or whatever. I, I spent nothing but time on this exam. Um, so I was able to perform at a, a pretty good level for it. But there's, you know, you just have to really manage your time. I mean, we're running a, this Sunday, we're running like a mum's session for how to get through the primary exam. And really, it, it, you have to make the sacrifices one or the other. But at the end of the day, I'd say whether you get onto training or not, 
you know, your life will be good doing what you want to do. If family is what you think you will love. Career is definitely not going to make up for that. So I, I encourage you to actually just go, what are my values? What do I want out of the future? And based on that, go, actually, you know what? I think family is more important than anything. I'm just going to have family whenever I want. Um, and that might sacrifice career in a little way, realistically, but that's still what I wanted. Um, from a practical point of view, if you have the time, exactly what Malik said, get past your first part, get onto the program. And that way, the primary exam is such a hard exam, you kind of get that out of the way before you start. Uh, I, I almost hate saying that, but the thing is, you can't have it all. And it really is about the, what is it, Jomo, the joy of missing out. <laughs> Um, regarding dual training, how does that change your day-to-day -day work? Do you end up focusing just quick care or just anesthesia eventually? Anyway, usually what happens is you do one of the train, like usually you do the anesthetics training program, but you have to do a couple of extra years in ICU. I can't remember the exact amounts, but I feel like you have to do at least two years, maybe three in ICU. Um, and then you have to do their exit. I think you have to do their exit exam as well, but probably just have to do one of the primary exams, probably the anesthetic primary and I'm sorry, I actually don't know the absolute details about that, but it'll be on the ANSC website. Um, so normally, how long do you see it taking for someone to get into anesthesia, internship onwards? Um, go for Mel. Yeah, I think um, on average, probably PGY 3 or 4, you'll be getting onto the program the year after that. Um, so like pretty much streamlined would be you do your internship, PGY 2 year, then a quick care HMO year, resident year in, in third year. And after that, you're on the program. It may take you an extra year or two, but that's the average, I think. Um, quite rare to actually get onto the program as a PGY2 applicant. Um, mm. Maybe 10 years ago, but I think that's becoming more and more rare now. Yeah, I think in our, our year, there's only one person that got straight on and the year before similarly. Um, that said, I, I still applied for the HMO. So I, I still applied for an anesthetic job in year three because I had done enough anesthetics and I thought my application was strong enough, but yeah, I, I didn't get it. That was fine. I got the quick care job. That was all good. Um, but I, I, I don't know. It was a bit of, is a bit of extra work, but I think everyone knew that I was applying for the quick care job and they, they and they've just had, they had a, they had good people to get the, you know, to get on the end of state training job um, above me. So that was, that was fine. Uh, do you know if there's a specific weighting applied to, to different sections of the CV? Uh, yeah, so that's a great, really good question. And I'd say overall, what looks like it's a, a bigger achievement, harder to do, more time, more initiative, more commitment. So, you know, if you've started a teaching company, that looks like, that looks as good as being the fifth author in a paper. Or it, sorry, that looks a lot better to me personally, because I'm looking at it from the lens of how exceptional is this person um, to give them that merit ranking. Um, so... Yeah, just know that if you've done 50 courses in various things, that's the easiest thing to do to do a course. You pay money, you get a certificate, you spend a day or a week or whatever. Just know it's, it really is about how well you've done, the initiative, um, and you know, yeah, that, that kind of level of stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's no points-based system to your application like other specialty trainings. Mm -hmm. I think there's no like point system like you do to research papers. That's three points for your application. It's not like that. Uh, in terms of getting a quick care HMO SRMO job, are there similar requirements for the CV references and to you? Uh, yeah, very similar. I think Australia wide, people are, um, you know, I think you have the categories up there, uh, but essentially all the demographic stuff, your, your rotations with no gaps in training or reason for the gaps in training. Uh, uh, then you've got your, you know, leadership, teamwork, you know, research, teaching, awards, scholarships. Um, finally, you know, references, extracurricular. Yeah, see, so most people would fill in those categories. And I'm sorry if I missed, missed a couple there. Um, yeah, the, the, so the best, the best advice is you have to look at the job description because if there are any differences in that, you'll be on the job description and it'll have literally what they're looking for. Again, it's very managerial, you know, it's just the same kind of document. Um, so I don't think there's too much difference, but I, I, I'd read every document I had to read uh, before applying. How does ask of you locum work versus normal HMO RMO year? I, I think it really depends on what you did in that year. Again, like if you did amazing stuff, formed good relationships with your team and were there for the extended period of time that you would similarly be in a normal job. But, you know, I, I don't think that's the, the worst thing in the world. You could have got amazing experience. But if you're in one hospital for a week 
or two in the next hospital. You just kind of done the time uh, forming relationships, getting projects underway. So I'd say it is much more difficult. If you've got a six month locum in somewhere, I think that could be amazing. Is it, what, what do you reckon, Mel? I think so. I think um, the difficulty with locum is, like you said, it's just too short of a period for each um, like job or work that you get. Um, so it is quite hard. And that, a normal HMO job will make that a bit easier. Mm. Is there a chance for New Zealand doctors with HMO Crick Care equivalent experience to get onto the program in Australia? That's a really good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I feel like, you know, th- there'll be all the, uh, you know, application requirements for the you know, Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, so APRA. You'd have to go through all of that and make sure you're, you know, equivalent. And, I, you know, I, I think it's worth applying, but I suspect that you need to be in the country and, and, and yeah, apply by being known to the anesthetics departments here. I just don't have a good feel for that. Um, I've never seen that happen. A New Zealand doctor coming over here uh, for, for an anesthetic training, but usually they just get on the training program there. And once they're specialized, they can just move back and forth with relative freedom um, with you know, minimal requirements because it's you know, the Australian New Zealand College of Anesthetists. I'm sorry I didn't have a better answer for that. Um, if you post that on the ABCs of Anesthesia Facebook page and group, people might be on there who would have information about that. Um, do many crick care jobs in PGY3 include anesthesia time or is it mostly ED, ICU? Well, what's your sense of that, Mel? Oh, I think if it, if it is a critical care resident here, a PGY3+, plus, it will include anesthetics. Um, I think, yeah, all of them should include anesthetics. Yeah. As, as in, there are some jobs that call themselves crick care jobs, which don't have anesthetics. You need to clarify that. So in the job interview, absolutely say, hey, uh, th- 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 you, they know what you want to do. You say, I really want to do anesthetics. Is there the opportunity to have anesthetic time in this crick care job? Um, and can I? is it possible to have that in the first half of the year? These are all very relevant questions for the job um, because I know that some jobs, they don't tell you where the rotations are. So you might be balancing the offer in one place with unknown amounts of anesthetics at mm. unknown times, later in the year equals can't get a reference from anesthetics uh, versus another job that has certain amounts of time in anesthetics and is at the start of the year. So that'll be the thing you have to balance up. Yeah, and I think like, as a critical care resident, if you are planning on applying to anesthetics, then you're very much like well-supported. You've got the whole department backing you, getting you ready for the application. So um, I think those jobs without an anesthetic rotation in them might be a bit different to the critical care resident jobs that do offer anesthetics. Um, how does the college view rural internship experience? I think it, it, it doesn't matter that you've done rural. It's, it's, I think it's favor, absolutely favorable, is uh, equally favorable, especially if you have good references and you've done something in that time. Um, uh, yeah, like literally, uh, when, I, when I think about it, there's no reason why someone's rural versus city except for, potentially just choice of where they want to be. So I, don't, I, I wouldn't judge that personally. I don't think people judge that um, in any way, especially if you're as competitive in what you've done. I'd say the difference is maybe on one hand, there's less opportunities for research and less interested. Like I think there's less rural hospitals that are high, you know, have a big research department with multi-million dollar funding, like say the Alpha Hospital um, in Melbourne. Uh, so that might be a disadvantage. But on the positive side, you may have really good relationships with less consultants who have more time for you. So those who are interested in teaching and audits and things like that, you could get more done, I think. Great questions, everyone. We'll stick around for another 30 seconds, I think, just in the interest of time. But um, yeah, so I'll I'll run uh, far more of these kind of junior sessions uh, you know, aimed at the junior doctor level. So the, there's the ABC's Anesthesia Bootcamp series, which I run regularly, will run regularly throughout next year. And they'll, you know, have everything you need in your, uh, for someone doing their first six to 12 months of anesthetics. So really for that intern, resident, prick care year level, maybe even early basic training. And so all of that will be on the anesthesiacollective.com website. Uh, you can also type ABC's Anesthesia.com. It goes to the same place. Um, so that's, that. Will, uh, you know, I'll have something for airways, cardiac patients, whether to postpone or proceed, pain management. I'll just run a whole series of those, but we'll also have junior, junior doctor and medical student sessions on the more, uh, more beginner stuff in anesthetics as well. So, uh, yeah, just look for that on the website and I'll advertise it from the Facebook page and group as well.
what is your plan for approaching the primary? Go for it, Malik. What is your plan? Into your question. <laughs> that is a good question. Um, essentially, having a good study group is really important. Um, it's starting quite early, so twelve months study plan um, with a good, uh, like, you know, constant time applied to your study plan. Um, and yeah, just basing it off the curriculum. And for me, like, so I'm sitting mine in March 2024. I could have started in August um, of next year, but I knew that the next couple of months for me were going to be quite difficult from, you know, personal life commitments. And so delayed that until March. So I know I've got the right amount of time to allocate to the primary. So getting your resources right. Um, which resources do you recommend? Um, it's a good question. So there's on the ANSCA website, there's um, a list of recommended texts that I think are quite core. Um, to your learning. There's a quite a few um, useful resources. So there's um, often courses that get run throughout the year and to, um, to prepare you for the primary exam. There's through your schemes as well, there's weekly teaching that you receive um, from the consultants. So for us, it's every Monday. We've got around three to four hours of teaching. Um, and other than that, I'm someone, I'm more of like a visual learner. So um, videos online and things like that for me through YouTube are things that I use to learn often. Um, that's really good advice. Um, I'm pretty sure so on anesthesiacollective.com, I'm pretty sure I've got a page just dedicated to um, uh, that. I'll just um, check that myself now. Uh, education, primary exam. No, I haven't put it up yet. Uh, I've got a whole how-to guide on the primary exam and all that. So I'll put it up on my website uh, pretty soon. As I just get you know get back in and look at that, and I'll advertise it on the Facebook page as well. But yeah, it's a whole Lahiri's well, part one tips kind of thing uh, where I've got everything you need to know, literally every step of what I did to get this exam. And a few useful podcasts as well. I think like the Anesthesia Coffee Break um, Lahiru. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, if you start listening to the Anesthesia Coffee Break, you'll get a sense of what's out there as well because we'll be chatting about that. So that's with Dr. Stanter. He runs Adrenaline Memories. You don't need to sign up for that now. It's um, for people about to sit, sit their exam. There'll be uh, literally weekly shoots, uh, which he runs, getting people through kind of the intense knowledge of it. But yeah, that's on Adrenaline Memories and Patreon. He's got an Instagram page where he puts stuff up as well. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Uh, looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> NSTG Coffee Break on repeat. Love it. Hey guys, um, you know my email, abczernesties at gmail.com. Really, we'll you know, try to get back to you on anything. Um, and yeah, if people really want to help out with ABC's Anesthesia, you know that I run a lot of this uh, and we donate whatever we make to charity. We run these courses and stuff. If that's something you're interested in, you want to develop a kind of a relationship with ABC's Anesthesia, please let me know. Um, there's always things that need to get done. And uh, yeah, see you guys next time. Thank you so much, Malik. It was just really great to... Get, get our uh, a real quick air person and future yeah, thanks, guys. on. Thanks so much. All, right, all the best. See you guys. This will go up on YouTube. See you guys next time. Now, what's new with ABCs of Anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills, from foundations in anesthesia, as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well. 